Uh, Tony Blair, in the middle of the Labour leadership camp in 2015, you said of people voting for Jeremy Corbyn, if their heart says vote for Corbyn, well, get a transplant. Um, where are you relieved that Labour didn't get elected? No, I wasn't relieved that Labour didn't get elected because I, I would, despite everything, uh, I was passionately opposed to the re-election of Boris Johnson. But the fact is we were never going to be elected, not, not with this leadership and not with these ideas. It was, it was just never going to happen. So with this leadership and these ideas, you wouldn't have wanted a Labour government to be elected because they weren't the ideas of the leadership that you backed. Yes, but on the issue of Brexit, look, I didn't want a Brexit general election. I begged people, do not give the Tories a Brexit general election. Boris Johnson was locked in a box and we handed him the key to get out of the box. So, but since it was a Brexit general election, then despite all my difficulties with the Corbyn leadership and with their manifesto, nonetheless, I voted Labour and I wanted to do everything I could to stop Brexit. But anyway, that's history. But you did spend four years undermining Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, for goodness sake. Yes, you did. No, come on. He, he, I disagree with him in the same way that he, by the way, dis disagreed with me when I was Labour leader. But you were saying he was a risk to the country. I think a lot of the policies and politics that he represented was a real problem for the country. Yes, I think the, the anti-Western attitude is a real problem for the country. Having said that, the bigger risk in this election, which I stated very clearly, was the election of a Conservative government committed to Brexit and committed potentially to a no-deal Brexit. But, you know, there's no point in people trying to... I mean, look, the one thing that really would be bizarre is to blame me for the election defeat. This was a defeat of not just an individual, and I've got nothing against Jeremy Corbyn as a person. It was a defeat of an ideology. And if we don't understand that and reflect on the massive gap between where we are and where the British people are, we're, we're not going to get back. I'll talk about that in a moment, but do you think Jeremy Corbyn has taken full responsibility for that loss? Yes, to, to, to a degree, but it doesn't, it's not, th th there's no point in sort of beating him over the head and saying you've got to, you've got to go out there and apologise and so on and so forth. It's not the issue anymore. But what was his biggest mistake? It, it's a wrong set of ideas. It's not progressive politics. It's a regression to, on the economy, a form of far left economic policy, which is really about a big state, nationalisation, tax and spend. There's no way the modern population is going to vote for that. And then on foreign policy, anti-Western foreign policy, the combination of the two. It's, a, it's not his biggest, his biggest immediate mistake was to agree to a Brexit general election. But the, the roots of the problem go much, much deeper than that. In that case, part, part of those roots are surrounding, presumably, the people that were right beside him. And two of those people were Seamus Milne and Carrie Murphy. I mean, should they go? Does it matter whether they, I mean, of course, they're all going to go. The question is what replaces them. Well, I mean, but some would say that, it, you know, you were in a way a gift to the left because you emboldened them because you were so anti-Corbyn. Yeah, but the, 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 in politics, you've got to, you've got to say where, what you believe in and you've got to, and, you know, I've never resented the fact that all the way through my leadership, he was highly critical of it. I didn't mind. It's fine. I don't care if someone disagrees with me. The question is now we've suffered... I mean, a catastrophic defeat. Yeah, I mean, and the issue is, how do we get from where we are to where we need to be? Otherwise, we're not looking at another five years and a fifth election defeat. We're looking at defeat going well into the future. But if you look actually at where the rot started, some, some would say, you know, there's a Guardian poll in 2007 that, about you. You were too concerned with spin. You were out of touch with Britain. You weren't trustworthy. You were insincere. One of the things that was said was that Labour, right back then, took the North for granted even then, through globalisation and everything else. I went to Wakefield and people said, Labour doesn't work for us, it hasn't worked for us. Do you take responsibility for that? Um, I don't take responsibility for losing the Labour heartlands because we didn't. In 2005, my majority in Sedgefield was 20,000. How did you feel Dennis, about Sedgefield this time? Terrible. Of course, terrible. Because, by the way, a Tory government will do nothing for the people there, right? The, the, the majority in 2005 in Bolsover, Dennis Skinner's seat, was 18,000. We didn't lose the Labour heartlands. And yes, of course, look, in 2007, I've been in power 10 years. We've been through many, many difficult things, including Iraq, Afghanistan, 9-11, tuition fees. If you come to your, after your third election and people decide we want to change, it would be odd if people didn't want to change. But 
you know, we haven't, we're not talking in the context of Labour having won three elections, we're talking in the context of Labour having just lost four. But you can talk about the economy and, and everything else, but of these 60 seats that Labour lost, 52 were seats that Labour voters had voted leave because they believed that their best bet was outside the European Union. But you were going in Europe, around the capitals, in a way undermining that democratic decision of these Labour voters. Right, so this is an argument I really do take very seriously, which is that, that people like myself, by insisting on continuing the argument around Brexit, um, caused us a problem in those Labour heartlands. And I don't discount it at all, but I'd say two things in respect of it. The first is that you can't unite the country over Brexit. Boris Johnson understands this, by the way. The to Brexit is a Tory project. What he decided is you can't unite the country over Brexit, do it, and then try and move on. From my perspective, because I believe so passionately against Brexit and think it will do nothing for these communities, my view is you had to do everything you can to get this, the decision back before the British people, and you would then have to find other ways of dealing with the underlying anxieties that drove this but Brexit the, vote. But right. the Labour voters in those 52 seats exactly. didn't agree with you. Well, hang on. This is, this is the important point. I believe if you'd had the right strategy from the beginning, if you'd said, look, we accept the result, the government's now got a mandate to negotiate an agreement, but we reserve the right, if this deal is not a good deal, to put it back before the British people, I promise you, the majority of people in constituencies like mine would have listened to that argument. And there's something else, which is the second point, because I do take seriously this argument, because it's put forward by what I would call the, a lot of reasonable people in the Labour Party. If we'd simply become a Leave Party, what would have happened to all those other seats we've got? What would have happened to the fact that the bulk of our members were passionately anti-Brexit. We, by the way, had twice as many Remain voters as Leave voters oh. voting Labour. And one of the interesting things is the biggest drop amongst any age group, 2017 to 2019, was amongst young people. So, so you, you, you can't win on Brexit. That's why we should never have agreed, by the way, a Brexit general election. You can't win on but Brexit. But it wasn't yours to agree the Brexit general election. Well, it Did was, you actually. hear Vet Cooper say, well, it, well, it was. Well, I mean, they should is... not have gone forward and actually exceeded the election. Correct. So you might have heard Vet Cooper this morning saying that both you, you know, funnily enough, you and Jeremy Corbyn, the same on this, were too internationalist. You weren't patriotic enough. Come on. Well, we, we never lost on patriotism during my time as a Labour leader. I mean, I don't think people think we won three elections. We won three elections because we had massive investments in public services. We did things like the, the minimum wage, Sure Start, additional support for childcare. We put in a whole lot of legislation that supported people. We did radical reforms in many, many areas, but we were tough on defence, tough on law and order, and we kept those people with us. You talk about moving uh, the Labour Party forward. Uh, Alan Johnson, um, trenchant Alan Johnson <laughs> said, uh, the working class have always been a big disappointment to John Lansman of Momentum and his cult. I want them out of the party, go back to your student politics. Is he right? Do you want Momentum out? Well, I think he is absolutely right in saying that the far left that has taken over the Labour Party, if they remain in a position of authority, if they're in charge of the Labour Party going forward, the Labour Party, I think, is finished. The Labour Party's finished. So you want momentum out? Well, it's not a question of expelling people out of the party, although it, it, it's a question... Well, Derek Hatton, we've been there before. We have been there before. And, and, and by the way, one of the things that's really troubling me, and why I think this is so much worse than 1983, in 1983 you had a Labour leader, Michael Foote, who was never going to win the election, but he was expelling the militant tendency. He was actually pushing back on the Benite surge in the Labour Party. Neil Kinnock came in, he actually expelled the militant tendency. So, you know, but it's not, a question, it's not a question so much of expelling people, it's a question of taking the Labour Party back for what I would call sensible mainstream Labour politics. And that includes, by the way, a, a traditional left of the Labour Party. But that traditional left that stands in the, in the, in the shoes of Nye Bevan, Michael Foote, Neil Kinnock, John Prescott, that is a different left from these that's guys. That's old. That's gone. I mean, you, you know, you look that's at the unions gone. now and you say, well, you know, I, you know the big union leaders, are they actually in touch with what the working class want? Now? Of course not. They're not a lot of them. I mean, the ones that are, by the way, like the, the, the one private Len sector... Len McCluskey, really, the, the, is he in touch? No, I think he's not, because these are the people who talk about the working class, but they ignore what they're saying to them. But, uh, 
if you take the one private sector union that has done well in these past 20 years, which is Usdor, that's the one they tend not to listen to. So you have Keir Starmer this morning saying that Labour has to be a broad church. It has to have momentum and it has to have, a quite funny expression here, self-declared Blairites in it. So you need a broad church. You need momentum in as well. Yeah, but this is... The, 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 look, I understand what, what, where Keir and others are coming from because, you know, I've been in the position of... 1983 and then the long process whereby I became leader of the Labour Party myself, I completely get that, you know, you've got to be a, do a certain amount of shimming and body swerving and equivocating to get to, to the right place as leader. I mean, I get it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a practical politician in that sense. But here's the minimum, the minimum that any would-be leader has got to say because the public will listen at this point and they'll they'll ask themselves are you guys getting it or not getting it the minimum they've got to say is this was a catastrophic defeat and it was a rejection of is a, an existential defeat it is an existential defeat and we're listening and we understand that not just the individual we put forward as leader but the ideas that he represents or are she. not yeah well, well in the case yeah. of the what they've just had in the election are not what right. what, uh, what we want if they I understand you've got to do all of this these things to make sure that you you bring as much of the Labour Party with you as possible but the problem that you've got with the momentum people and it's just worth and momentum you know is made up of different groups of people as well I think you know there are some people who are sort of hardline folk and there are other people who just want a more radical government so I'm I'm cautious about saying all of these, you know, all of these people are of the, the, the one frame of mind, because I, I think that's almost certainly not true. And by the way, leaders can, can help change a party over time. But the problem with the, the far left, the people, you know, you mentioned some of them just around uh, Jeremy Corbyn and so on. The trouble is they want to take the Labour Party over. They've been engaged in a four-year process of taking it over. Seamus Mill and Carrie Murphy. They're not going to share power. So this is, this is a problem, I'm afraid. And that's why if you want to do the analogy with 1983, you know, whatever else you say, the far left were put back on the fringe again. Which, Because uh, unfortunately, if they're not, they don't desire to be mm. part of the, of the thing. They desire to own the thing. Coming on to uh, the last section now, I mean, it will not escape your notice that Labour had its most disastrous result in Scotland. A lower share of the vote since 1910, Scott's last Antarctic visit, uh, according to one commentator. Uh, one Labour MP. Richard Leonard is a Corbynite. Should he stand down from the leadership of the Scottish Parliament, Labour's leadership in the Scottish Parliament? Um. I don't want to get into whether an individual should stand down or not. But what I would say is my One expert... MP where you left 41 MPs. Yep, no, I know, of course, and it's a ridiculous situation. And the reason for it is that we went sort of left and nationalist when it was perfectly obvious what we had to do was be strongly supportive of the union and in a centre-left position as a, as a party. So, I, I, again, I don't want to get into Richard Leonard himself Well, personally. is the broader point, though, is there any way back for Labour in Scotland? You know, you've entirely yeah. ceded to the Nationalists. And what is the way back for Labour in Scotland? It's perfectly obvious. If the Labour Party in Scotland had been... It did, has been neglected for a long time by the Labour Party, I have to say. Yeah, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's really not rocket science, the Labour Party in Scotland. In my view, it had to be pro-Europe, pro-Union, um, and it had to be centre-left. If it was those three things, it's got a perfectly good constituency. It can campaign for social justice, but in a realistic way, so it can bring a lot of the centrist voters to it. it can it's be... too late for a lot of people, some say, that actually you've lost those Labour voters to the SNP, so therefore moving forward... Moving should, forward. N well, Nicola Sturgeon is requesting a second referendum on Scottish independence. She will uh, apply for se Section 30 to Westminster. Mm. Should Westminster grant that? Look, I don't want to see another referendum in Scotland. Um, so I you agree with Boris Johnson? I, 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 I would, would do everything I could to resist this, but I think we've got to recognise one thing, uh, which is that unless you, unless you revive 
an alternative form of politics to the SNP, you're going to be in a lot of difficulty. Now, now you're going, that's going to be a long-term affair, whatever it, you do. And Nicola Sturgeon is wanting a referendum next year. Yeah, is well, it I, her no, democratic no. right to ask Scotland's democratic right, given the result, to have Well, that? it's a democratic right to ask for it, but I, I, I don't think we should we should accede to it. No, so I you agree with that. Boris Johnson then? Well, I'm not I agree with Boris Johnson. I've always taken the position I'm against another referendum in Scotland, it, unless it becomes absolutely manifestly clear that um, it's the settled will of the Scottish people and so on and so forth. Is but, 48 SNP MPs not settled enough for you? Well, I think if you add up all the people in opposition to it, it's not, actually. I think in any event, you know, we've, we've got Brexit to get through. <laughs> I don't think you want to put another whole lot of uncertainty on the United Kingdom at this present time. But to come back to your answers, what, what do we do politically? Look, we actually ended up in a situation we were behind Ruth Davidson's Tories, right? Yeah. So what... You've got what, one MP. Right. What Ruth Davidson did was show from a Conservative perspective how you can actually rebuild an alternative to the SNP. But we should never have been in, this, in the position we were in the Labour Party in Scotland. We never needed to be. So what's your best chance? Is it to merge with the Liberal Democrats? No, I think you've got to start um, from... A, two things have got to happen. Okay, this is absolutely essential, and it really doesn't matter who leads the Labour Party at the moment in this sense, that unless these two things happen, it's going to be very difficult to get back to power. The first is you've got to have a big tent conversation, which has got to be a real engagement with the public out there as to how you build what, a winning some kind coalition. of constitutional convention? Or? No, no, it's not a constitutional not convention. A convention. It's, 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 a, it's the different elements of progressive politics, which can include, by the way, the Labour Party, the Liberal Democrats, you've got other elements of politics, people who are disaffected from politics, people who aren't with any political party at the moment because they feel politically homeless. But you need that, what is the, the right winning coalition? And secondly, you need the policy because the thing that's, that's letting the left down, progressive politics, everywhere by the way, not just in the UK, is the absence of a policy agenda, which in my view has to start from the technological revolution. But, but you say a leader doesn't matter, but of course a leader matters no, because I if it's... Leader didn't matter. I said in this okay. context, of so, course the leader matters. So, I mean, I know you've been asked who you would like to see lead the party and you haven't said, but we're yeah. in a situation where... <laughs> Wouldn't be very wise, would it? <laughs> well, you are a former prime minister, is not an unreasonable question to no, ask No, it's an I'm, I'm absolutely uh, reasonable question we, to ask. Do, do you actually think perhaps it should be a woman? You're the only party that's never had a female leader. That's extraordinary. Yeah. There's a great case for it, provided that whether it's a woman or a man, they're in the right political position so, to win. So, so it's not it Rebecca Long Bailey, it's maybe more Jess Phillips. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm not getting into who should be the leader no. because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be very sensible for me to do it. But, but hang on, if you ha if you believe in that, if you well, you don't. But if one was to believe in that manifesto that you put that was put forward at this election and then became leader, as in Rebecca Long Bailey, would that be the right direction for the party? No, if we keep if we keep the same politics that has just lead, led to this catastrophic defeat, it wouldn't matter whether the person's a woman or not, it, it, they're not going to win. So, because it's just been rejected. And really, of course, it would be a great thing if the Labour Party had a, a, a woman leader. But the most important thing is that you have a leader with the politics that can allow us to win an election, because otherwise, we're just a bunch of talkers, we're not doing anything. Look, when we came to power in 1997, we did 18 years of Conservative government. And all we'd done is pass resolutions, make speeches, say how awful it was, these terrible Tories. Only when you're in power can you do things. Only when we were in power could we introduce a minimum wage. Could we change the social legislation? Well, finally, is it going to be a decade? Finally, is it going to be a decade? It's not be, going to be five years. It'll be as long as it takes us to wake up understand what's happening, build the right coalition, get the right policy agenda that can be radical, but it's got to be attached to the future. Right, if we do that, we can win the next election. But if we don't do it, it doesn't matter how many years, it's not measured by years, it's measured by the power of your ideas and the ability to understand where the public actually is and at the moment. And this is the challenge for the Labour Party. The public is here and they're so far over there that the camera can't, it's not wide enough to catch them. Okay, so you're going to have to bridge that. One final thing, uh, Lord Faulkner said there is molten anger. Are you angrier than you've ever been since you left power? Um, 
you know, I've come to the conclusion in politics that anger is a redundant emotion. I am more motivated than I've ever been since leaving power because I really do believe we just made a disastrous mistake for the country about its future, which is Brexit. And believe me, in time it will be seen to be a terrible mistake. We're going to have to make it work now, but it's a terrible mistake. And the Labour Party, by its self-indulgence, and that's what it was in the end, was the effect of handmaiden of Brexit. It's not our fault because the fault is with those who advocated it, but our combination of misguided ideology and utter incompetence allowed it to happen. And yeah, that is should be motivating and get angry as you like. But the most important thing is now to make the changes necessary so that you can have a government that can command support amongst the British people and can govern with basic social democratic values. It's perfectly possible. There's nothing wrong with Labour's values, by the way. The values are perfectly sensible. But its politics has got to be modern, engaged with the future and realistic. And are you going to be at the centre of that conversation? Do you want to come back in and be at the centre of that conversation? I will contribute where I can and convene when I can. But, you know, and look, people, people can listen to me or not listen to me. I've always said this. It's, you know, it's my right to speak and it's your right to refuse to listen. But don't tell me I can't speak and I won't tell you you've got to listen. Thank you very much, Tony Blair. Thank you.